Today, we're going to learn a little about transient circuits. Last class period, we learned about Kirchhoff's laws. And I'm actually going to start with like three clicker questions right off the bat that deal with what we did last class period. The class period before that, we had Ohm's law. And between Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's laws, you really can solve anything in a DC circuit. A DC circuit means DC is direct current. And so direct current, current's always going the same direction. Well, what we've been doing and what everybody considers direct current is a little more precise than that. Constant current in the same direction is what we've been working with. And as long as you have constant current in the same direction, DC, what we've learned, Kirchhoff's two laws and Ohm's law is all you need to solve those circuits. Now today we're going to introduce transient circuits. Transient circuits are changing from one steady DC case to another steady DC case. So it's transient because it's going between two states. And of course, things become a little more interesting there because you have a time component. There was no time in the circuit problems we've been working up to this point. So let's get started with some clicker questions. Number one, which terminal has a more positive voltage in the figure below? Actually, the fact that this is number one means that I took out the other two questions. <laughs> There's still a total of three questions, but yeah, we don't have the other two that I was going to have. Okay, everybody's answered. That was nice and quick. Every single person was correct. I love to see that. Yes, we understand the importance of identifying what direction the current arrow is, which is going to be really beneficial to us in the next lab because that's a key component of the next lab. Okay, we talked about capacitors in series and parallel. What do you remember about capacitors in series and parallel? Which will make you have a bigger capacitance if you put two capacitors in series or if you put them in parallel? The correct answer was parallel. The easy way to remember that is because capacitance, the physical equation for capacitance is C equals kappa, the dielectric constant, epsilon zero, area of the plates divided by the separation of the plates. If you put them in parallel, you're basically increasing, you're adding together the areas of the plates. So you're essentially adding up the capacitances. We worked it out from theory, talking about, okay, if they are placed in parallel, they're going to have the same voltage, but they're going to have different charges. So the total charge stored will be bigger. And that also gave us a theoretical reason for them. So this picture here is showing the equivalence of when you add them up, it's like you're making much bigger plates. But it also has that key for the theoretical that the charge is bigger because you're adding up the charges. So what happens when you put the capacitors in series? Capacitance is decreased. And that turned out to be because you have the same charge on each capacitor when you put them in series. So that led to our theoretical reasoning for that. So we have the two equations, capacitor and parallel was just the sum, capacitor in series isn't shown here. And you'll see that just like me, the textbook uses three capacitors so that you don't fall into the trap of using the equation that only applies to two. This equation applies to any number, you just have plus dot, 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 dot. So those were our rules for adding capacitors in series or parallel. So now our second two questions, I told you there are three. When you add resistors, which configuration results in the highest resistance, series or parallel? So this is for, obviously,
Aaron, do you? Okay. All right, and everybody answered series. When you put resistors in series, the or the resistance is bigger. R series was R1 plus R2 plus R3, etc. And then the last one, which I trust no one's going to miss, when adding capacitors, which configuration results in the highest capacitance? Okay, and once again, everybody nailed it. Good job. That gives me confidence that you guys have been learning as we go through and not, you know, sitting in class and thinking about, oh, I could be snow skiing or these days kids go snowboarding, crazy things like that. Hey, you're not supposed to nod along when I say that, Sandy. That's <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the transient behavior now. Charging a capacitor. This figure shows a battery connected in series with a resistor and a capacitor. And notice there's a switch down there on the bottom. Now when that switch is open, how much current flows through? Okay, let me, clear, let me be clear. When I say when the switch is open, I mean when the switch is like this so that there's no contact here. So when the switch is like that, how much current flows? None. So if no current flows, then I'm not going to have any charging going on for the capacitor. So that's just our starting position. We don't have a circuit because it's not closed. But then when we flip the switch, then suddenly I can have charge flow. Now when I flip that switch, What's the voltage initially across the capacitor? What was the voltage before when I had nothing connected to it? Zero. So I flip the switch. The voltage is proportional to the charge. And charge doesn't instantly jump. It takes time to flow. So I'm going to have to have that same voltage of zero on the capacitor right after I flip the switch. So then I can look at my circuit and say, OK, Let's consider this part of the circuit. Let's change to black. This part of the circuit ground. Because I have this switch, this whole thing is now connected to ground. That little triangular thing I drew means ground. And that means it's my reference point. And so this here on this side, if the negative side is zero volts, what's the positive side going to be? I go, let's say the EMF here, just to give it a number, let's say that's 10 volts. So if I start at zero and I go through a power supply going from negative to positive, what's my voltage on the other side? Plus 10 volts. So this is going to be plus 10 volts here. If the voltage across the capacitor is zero, and it's zero on the bottom, what's the voltage on the top going to be? Zero. So that resistor, what's the voltage difference across the resistor? It's 10 volts. Or I put the number in so we could get some physical things to it. It's the full voltage of the power supply. So that means the instant I flip the switch, the current is going to flow through that resistor. I initial is equal to, using Ohm's law, right, V over R, that's going to be the full voltage of my power supply minus zero because that's the voltage on the other side of the resistor. And so that's going to be my initial current. I'm going to have a large current initially. And if I have a large current, I'm going to have a big voltage drop. And of course, I actually already defined this as my voltage drop on that as the full voltage drop and the voltage drop across my capacitor is zero. But if I have a current, that means charge is flowing. So what's happening to the charge on the capacitor? It's starting to go up. But as that charge goes up on the capacitor, that means the voltage is going up. 
And so if the voltage is going up on the capacitor, what's that doing to the voltage difference across the resistor? Gila says it's making it less. As the capacitor charges up, instead of being zero at the top, it might be one volt. And then I'd only have a nine volt drop across the capacitor. As it charges more, eight volts. And so eight volts, two, you know. So as the current flows, the charge on the capacitor increases, so the volts in the capacitor increases, which means that the voltage difference on the resistor decreases. As the voltage difference on the resistor decreases, what happens to the current? It has to decrease. So we're going to start at maximum current, and then over time, as current flows, the capacitor charges and the current drops until after a very, very long time, I will reach the point where the voltage across the capacitor is the same as the voltage across the power supply, the battery, and there's no current that flows. So I can draw a graph of time on this axis and current on this axis. And it starts at maximum and it decreases, but the more it decreases, the slower, the lower the current is, uh, yes. The more it decreases, the less we have a change. And so it's going to go like that. Now, if you want to come to class tomorrow for the calculus class, we will work out the derivation for this equation. But it turns out that the current has the equation of maximum current e to the minus t over, and I'm just going to put a substitute tau. So tau is a time constant because it has to have units of time. That's the equation for the current as a function of time. Why is the current dropping? Okay, the voltage difference across the resistor is dropping because every coulomb that passes through the resistor goes to the capacitor increases the voltage on the capacitor, which in turn decreases the voltage across the resistor, lowering the current. Now, what is that tau? Once again, for the calculus tomorrow, we find that tau is equal to RC, where R is the resistance of the resistor and C is the capacitance of the capacitor. Now, if you look at this equation, if tau is a big number, then you're going to have small changes in time because you have time divided by a big number. If tau is a small number, you'll have rapid changes in time. So the bigger your RC is, the slower it will be to charge. The smaller your RC, the faster it will be to charge. And so we call this the RC time constant because it tells us about how quickly or slowly it's going to charge. And given this equation, you can easily say, well, what's the time for it to be one half of the maximum current, right? If I want the time for one half maximum current, I will just say my current at some time T1 is equal to the maximum over two and plug it in. So that would give me I0, I'm gonna change color, sorry. I0 over 2 is equal to I0 e to the minus T over tau. Everyone here knows we should cancel the I0s right now. And so I have 1 half equals E to the minus T over tau. What would I do next mathematically? Use the natural log because it's the inverse function of the exponential. So natural log of 1 half equals natural log of e to the minus t over tau. By the definition of an inverse function, the right side is minus t over tau. The left side, of course, is... I'm going to use the fact that natural log of 1 half is minus natural log of 2, right? The inverse. So I can get rid of the minus signs. And finally, the time that it takes to have 1 half the current is that time constant, the RC time constant, multiplied by the natural log of 2. So you should be able to do that kind of calculation pretty quick and easy. Now, 
I gave you hand waving arguments on why the current drops with time. Like I said, it takes calculus to get the rigorous equation that I have in the purple box. What we have from the picture here is showing the voltage on the capacitor is a function of time. So the voltage on the capacitor, if you look at that shape, that's just the inverse of the shape that I had before. Because as the voltage on the capacitor increases, the current decreases. And so this one here has the equation that the voltage across the capacitor is equal to is equal to that. It's the EMF times one minus E to the minus T over tau. So when time is zero, that's the EMF times one minus one or zero. But as time increases, it becomes EMF times one minus something that's getting smaller and smaller until it's just the EMF times one minus zero. So that's the equation for this curve. And once again, how do we get that? It's just the same calculus. So if you have, like if you have this one, you can go from that one to this. But if you accept one on faith of calculus, might as well accept the other on faith of calculus as well. So what's important about the charge time? What, what parameters set the time it's going to take to charge up the capacitor? Resistance and capacitance. So let's say that I have a, well, this is, I forgot that it had this picture, but this is the pic the current picture for the same idea, except for here the power supply has been removed. Power supply is removed, and now we're discharging the capacitor. We still have the capacitor, the resistance, and we're going to have an equation that follows once again the form of or wait, this is voltage. where tau is equal to RC. Now let's say we want to do something practical. So we have a disposable camera with a little flash. How does that flash work? Well, we have a filament, a piece of metal with a low resistor or resistance, and we're going to dump a lot of charge through it in a very short amount of time. So how do we make this work? We make a circuit that looks like this. Nice drawing. <laughs> I keep screwing things up. So this here is the flash bulb with resistance R flash. This is a charging or a resistor called RC. And we have a switch that can move from one position to the other. So when the switch is in the position shown, what's going to happen to the capacitor? It's going to charge. When the switch is flipped, then what happens? Then the capacitor is connected to the flash bulb, and we're suddenly going to have the energy stored in that capacitor dumped very quickly to the flash bulb. <clears throat> we're going to have two time constants here. We're going to have a charging time constant and a discharging time constant. If I'm charging, what's the resistance and capacitance involved as the circuit shown? What are the resistance and capacitances? R is equal to? RC. Just RC. And what's the capacitance? Yeah, that was the... 
So the time constant charging has to do with the RC. Now, if I do discharging, so in discharging, it's flipped over to that position. Then what's the resistance involved? RF. So we have two resistors, two different situations. We want to charge the capacitor, and we don't want to lose much energy in the charging. If I don't want to lose much energy, then I'm going to want to charge it relatively slowly. And so what am I going to do to charge it relatively slowly? I'm going to put a big resistor. I put that big resistor, it charges slowly, and I don't have a lot of loss. Then when I want to discharge it, I want to dump it really quickly. And so that resistance in the filament is very small. That's going to work to dump it really quickly. What would any benefit whatsoever be of this compared to just connect it to the battery? Why not just connect it to the battery and be done with it? That's exactly it. The battery has a chemical reaction that can only pump so much charge per second. Its, its current is very limited. Whereas that flash bowl or the capacitor, it could dump it all in no time if you just put a screwdriver across it. So you're allowed to, you're able to dump the energy much more rapidly. So you transfer energy slowly from the battery to the capacitor. So you want that capacitor to be nice and big so that you're storing a huge amount of energy. And then you connect it to that filament with a very low resistor and you dump the energy really quickly to make the bright flash. So you have, if you tear apart one of those little disposable cameras, you have a little AA cell in there, 1.2 to 1.4 volts. And then that's charging a big old capacitor. And if you take a screwdriver and you put it across the ends of that capacitor, you'll draw a nice, you know, arc. I mean, not a long one, but a very a lot of energy discharging it. So there's a very practical application. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about another practical application. I didn't bring it with me, but I have a, a cell phone. And that cell phone. You guys probably don't remember when smartphones first came out and people really complained because the old candy bar phones, you could charge it and last a week. The smartphone, you could charge it and last a day if you're lucky, right? And so we have to charge these, and nobody likes saying, oh, I've got to put it on the charger for an hour. And so we're constantly trying to find ways to charge it faster. Well, one idea is to, instead of having a battery in your phone, to have, uh, I think they call it a supercapacitor, to have a capacitor that can store an enormous amount of energy. And if it's a capacitor, you can charge it really quickly. Now you do have to have wires that can handle the current you're using, but you could conceivably charge your cell phone in a matter of minutes instead of a matter of hours if you had a super capacitor in there instead of a battery. And then you just have circuitry to make sure that you know, it doles it out at a nice slow rate if something happened, well, we've already seen with the Samsung Galaxy, was it S7 or whatever it was, that, that you can have problems with our liquid or liquid lithium ion batteries the way it is. But there's, there's a bit of danger, a bit of concern there if you were to have a capacitor because it's much more accessible energy. You can, you can have it come out much quicker than you can with a lithium ion battery. Now let's turn to something that's not practical, but that probably most of you have a good idea about. You guys know the story of the Ark of the Covenant, right? <laughs> so the Ark of the Covenant, it was held by the Philistines and then they returned it to Israel. And after some time, I can't remember who the king was, um, wanted to relocate and bring it back to Jerusalem. And so he had the Ark of the Covenant put on a cart and it was being pulled by these oxen, if I remember the story right. And it tipped, and was it Uzzah? 
Isaiah. Isaiah. Reaches out to study it. And what happens? He dies. So, according to our biblical story, why did he die? Because he wasn't supposed to touch it. Right? In fact, the way the ark was supposed to be transported, you're supposed to have priests who are ceremonially cleansed, carrying it on their shoulders, you know, with a rod. And that's not what was done here. And so the story we get from this in the Bible is about how you, you know, you follow God's instruction. Um, scientists, I, I, I don't understand the full idea on this, but they'll take biblical stories and say, okay, maybe there's a germ of truth there, even if I don't believe that there's God. How could I explain? And so we have things like explanations about the star that brought the the magi the wise men to yeah to jesus and they say well you know that could have been a comet or maybe it was a nova or a supernova or an angel fire um and then they take this story and they say well how was the ark of the covenant constructed what's the basic construction of it what's it made of it's not made out of gold it's plated with gold. It has gold leaf. What's underneath? Yeah, I think it's shittim wood or something like that, right? So it's made out of wood and then it has the gold leaf on it. That gold leaf is a conductor. And if you have a separation between two conductors, you're making a capacitor. In fact, we have things we call Leiden jars that basically have a piece of uh, a chain hanging out in the middle of the jar and then it has a metal coating on the outside. It's basically a huge capacitor between that chain in the middle and the metal on the outside. And people say the Ark of the Covenant was close enough that maybe it was behaving like a Leiden jar and because of just carrying it through the air and the rubbing of air on it, it developed a charge. And so it's charged up by you know, rubbing action just like when we have the rods. And then when he touched it, it discharged through him. It is conceivable. But you know what? I still believe that it was God acting. I, you know, call me Old Testament, but I, I believe that it was God acting. But it's something that scientists have tried to explain with this phenomenon. Here is an interesting example of capacitor circuit. This is, to me, it looks a lot more like the, uh, the old-fashioned form of a transistor. But light bulbs, the, the resistance of a light bulb changes with current. That is, when it's hot, the resistance becomes low. When it's cold, the resistance is much higher. And so this is a circuit that actually uses a capacitor along with a light bulb to get a moderate voltage on the light bulb. And the way it works is you simply have the capacitor, the light bulb, you have current flow to charge the capacitor until the capacitor charges up to a high enough level that it can have significant current flow through the light bulb. When it has a significant current flow through the light bulb, the light bulb gets hot, the resistance drops, that means the voltage drop across the light bulb is gonna drop as the voltage drop across the light bulb drops, you discharge the capacitor through the light bulb, and then you get too low a voltage, and the light bulb turns off, and it charges up again. And so you have the voltage alternating back and forth. This is making an alternating voltage by just using the light bulb and the capacitor. No physical switch to make the alternating voltage. It's kind of cool, right? I think. Um. <clears throat> these days you probably don't mess around with cathode ray tubes, but I did. I, when I moved here, I had a 65 inch, um, projection TV. It weighed 275 pounds. Sadly, I just had a hernia surgery. I couldn't help them lower down to the basement of my house. When it broke, I did try to get it out of my basement and decided I had to destroy it. It was too big and bulky and heavy to get up out of the basement. But when you have a projection TV, one of the things that you have to do 
is you have to focus it and you have to aim the little beams of electrons. And so you have to play around there in there. And it's really kind of scary because they're using voltages in the thousands of volts. Not only they're using voltages in thousands of volts, they use capacitors in there to help to stabilize things. And so you might uh, have this thing running and you're like, okay, well, I'm going to unplug it so it's safe. You unplug it, and if you stick your hand in there and just touch something, you have a good chance of dying, even though it's unplugged. Why do you have a good chance of dying? It's, it's illustrated in the picture, but why would you still have a good chance of dying even when you've unplugged it? The capacitor is still charged. And so they actually have things like a place for you to stick a rod that will short out the capacitors to make it safe for you to work in there. Because if you don't short out those capacitors, it's going to take a fair amount of time, like on the order of minutes, for them to discharge enough that it would be safe for you to touch them. So that's always something to keep in mind. When I, when I was in graduate school, we had this eczema laser. And it, once again, is using thousands of volts. And when you serviced it, you had a metal peg that you stick in there to make sure that you discharge all of the capacitors so you don't die servicing it. And on that story, I have to tell a funny story that happened in San Francisco. When I was teaching at PUC, they were doing some work on, I believe it was the BART line, Barrier Rapid Transit. And so they turned off the power for the BART line, and then they put in something like 13 different grounding rods in different places that were grounding between the high voltage line and the ground. Now, these weren't capacitors here. It's just to make sure that nobody's working in a situation where there might be somebody turned on the power while you're working to get electrocuted. So they do their work. When they're all done, they've got a checklist. If you pull one, check. If you pull two, check. If you pull three, check. Checklist says that all those grounding rods are pulled, and so they turn the power on. And all of the lights in San Francisco went out. I was actually in San Francisco with my family when that happened. We're like, what the heck? <laughs> all the lights went out because they actually only pulled out half of the grounding rods. And so when they turned on the power, they had a short between the high voltage coming from you know, the power generation plant and ground. And if you have a short between them, that means you have a path that circumvents anything you connected, just has zero resistance roughly. What's that going to mean for the current? Really high. And so you had a really high current draw, and that really high current draw was so high that before it could even blow the circuit breakers, it sheared a big shaft in the power generation plant because you have a turbine, and when you draw a huge current, you suddenly have a, <laughs> it's very hard to turn the turbine. And so it had an angular momentum, and also this side stops while well, this side's going, and it sheared that big old rod, which then meant they had, you know, had to do some work. Um, so that's a, another electrical safety thing, but I thought it was fun. Now for the last 15 minutes, I'm going to go over what I plan on doing at the end of the class last period. How to actually use your calculator when you're solving these circuit problems. So you have a circuit problem, I think it's just one, that's due from the homework today. And so we're going to go through how you do it. So first, we went through the steps last class period. I had, I think, students in the back help me out there. I need to go through and step one, identify all of the currents. So in the picture, the currents are already identified for me. Just like in your homework problem, they're identified for you because you can't ask what is I1 without knowing its direction. <laughs> so the currents are identified. Step two, what should I do next? Okay, determine the positive and negative for every resistor. So if I look at R1, which side is the positive side for R1, R, capital R1? Okay, top or bottom? Bottom, because that's the side the current goes in. What about for E1, that voltage supply? Which side? C, okay, because the long side is always the positive. Now, I'm going to read... 
draw I1. What was that? You just made both sides positive. I was going to make a joke, but no, it couldn't happen. Thank you. Okay, now I, I marked the current for resistor lowercase r1. Once again, which side is positive? I'm going to stop asking after this. Okay. C is the positive, D is the negative. Continuing on, I'm drawing all the current arrows in this color. I made my arrows so they match I1, I2, and I3. So now for my directions, Okay, so I've identified the positive and negative side for all of them now. What next? Okay, my meshes. I need to have the number of loops equal to the number of meshes. The meshes are the smallest possible loops. How many smallest possible loops could I make here? Two. two. And so I'm going to identify the two I'm going to use, and I always do... them clockwise because I just want to make sure I don't make mistakes. Those of you who've taken circuits class have probably learned very mechanical ways of doing this. The more mechanical it is, the less mistakes you can make. So, you know, you learn things like using a mesh current and all the resistors that are on your mesh have a positive and all the ones that are shared have a negative. You know, we're not going that far just so the circuit people know. <laughs> I've got my two meshes. What's the next step? Apply, voltage law. Apply Kirchhoff's voltage law. What is Kirchhoff's voltage law? Yes. The sum of the voltages on a loop is zero. So I start at the bottom left corner because that way I won't make a mistake. And I go around a clockwise fashion as indicated. So for loop one, and let me lean on um, Gabriel, starting at node A for loop one, what do I get for my voltage, the first voltage change? From A to like. So it's going to be from A to B. I have current I1. I'm going through R1. What's the voltage change? Um, I1, okay, positive or negative? Uh, negative? Negative, because I went from positive to negative. That's why I went through and put the plus and minus so I, I can just look at it and know. right? I, I could think it through each time, but it's easier if I just look at it and know. Okay, next one. <laughs> oh, James, toughy. What's my next voltage change on that loop? Plus E1. Brady, what's my next? Okay. Yeah, little R1. <laughs> now, just to make sure, how did he know that was I1? Because it's one branch and branches are things that have things in series. You have to have the same current for every element in a branch. So that's why he knows it's I1. And next up, um, Sandy, what's the next element? The voltage is there. Going from D to E. Is that going up or down going from D to E? Down. Okay, so that's a minus sign. And then using Ohm's law, what's the voltage drop? V equals I times R. And so it's just going to be that current, which was current one, multiplied by that resistance, R5. Okay, now, Paris, you get one that's a little more fun. 
going from E to L. Yes. Why was it plus, everyone? Because I was going against the current this time, but still just using Ohm's law. <laughs> Keep going. Um, okay. Megan. Um, uh, yep. And then Mahala, what's next? It's going to be minus because we're going from plus to minus. And we're back to where we started. So I'm back to where I started. It must equal zero. So I've made one equation. Now that equation is kind of spread out. I'm going to reorganize it. I'm going to collect I1 times all of the things that were multiplied by I1. So I1 was multiplied by minus capital R1 minus lowercase r1 minus R5, and then plus I2, and I2 was multiplied by capital R2 plus lowercase r2. There was no I3 in that, and then I had plus E1 minus E2 equals zero. <laughs> Last thing I'm going to do is move the voltages to the other side of the equal sign. And I'm actually going to do that in the line I just made. So I'm erasing the equals zero and changing this to equals minus E1 plus E2. So I changed the sign of the voltages because I moved them across the equal sign. So now I have all the terms with currents on the left side. The terms without currents are on the right side. One equation. I got to make a second one because I have a second mesh. Now this one here, I'm going to do myself instead of asking people. It'll go a lot quicker. So starting here at J and going up, I'm going down I3, R3, and then up E2 because I'm going from the minus to the positive in the E2. Then I'm going down I2, lowercase r2 down I2, capital R2. I'm still going with the current, so it's down for the next one, minus I3, lowercase r4, going against that power supply, so minus E4, going with the current, so minus I3, lowercase r3, going from negative to positive, so plus E3, and I'm back to where I started, that's equal to zero. And again, I'm going to rewrite this. So I have no I1s, but I have I2 times minus <coughs> R2 minus lowercase R2 plus I3 times negative capital R3 negative lowercase r4, negative lowercase r3, equals minus e3 plus e4. Uh, I missed one, didn't I? Um, no, I, I have it there. I just forgot it in my work. It's minus e2, minus e2, minus e3 plus e4. So I have two equations here. Okay, this one and this one. How many unknowns do I have? Go ahead, Paris. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, in the second line, when you said minus, minus E1 plus E2, is that this one? Yeah, right there. Why is that I3 and not <coughs> I2? Be because it's I3 is the current that goes through this entire branch. Right, it's, it's labeled I3 there. So I2 is going through this branch. Uh, one more. 
Okay, so that's two equations, but how many unknowns do I have? Three. I1, I2, and I3 are unknown. The resistances and the voltages were given to me. I didn't know the I's. So laws of math, if I have three unknowns, I have to have three independent linear equations to solve it. And so I need one more equation. So I have to go to my next step. What's that? Identify essential nodes. What makes, okay, a node is where any two wires come together. What makes a node essential? Having three or more. So how many places do I have three or more here? A and E. So I just choose to do one of those two and use Kirchhoff, that the next step is use Kirchhoff's current law, sum of the currents at a node equals zero on one of those two nodes. So just choose, well, let's choose node A because node A is the one that they wrote the currents on. So sum of the currents at node A equals zero equals, and I'm just gonna say if it comes in, it's positive, if it leaves, it's negative. So I3 comes in, I1 and I2 leave, And there's my final equation. Now I have three equations, three unknowns. The question I was asking when class ended last class period was, how do you solve these? And if you have not had linear algebra or not had somebody explain the linear algebra solution, you're probably going to say, well, I will combine two equations to eliminate one variable and then put that into the third equation to eliminate the final variable. And then I'll know one variable and then I go back through them. It's a lot of work, but there's a much easier way lose using linear algebra. So here's the equation we just worked out. I put, <laughs> I, I skipped a page. Here's the equations that we just made. That one, this one, and this one. They're arranged a little bit differently because I made them before class, but they're the same equations we made. And then I just substituted in the numbers that were given. And so the ones with arrows have the numbers we're given. So we have I1 times 25.1 ohms plus I2 times a negative 40.5 ohms plus I3 times zero ohms equals minus 24 volts. And this second one here, and finally the currents. I take those and using linear algebra, I can write those three equations as a matrix operation. When you multiply matrices, you take a single row and multiply by the column. So you're saying 25.1 times I1 minus 40.5 times I2 plus 0 times I3 is equal to the 24. I shouldn't have drawn it through. I should have drawn it underneath. Would have made more sense there. So you could read it. And so this is encoding those three equations in matrix form. And now with linear algebra, we could write that as A is this three by three matrix here. So this here is A. And then I is this column matrix. And E is that column matrix. I, of course, want it to be scripty, but it wasn't. And using linear algebra, if we can find the inverse matrix, who here wants to find an inverse matrix? No one, right? But if we could find an inverse matrix, we can multiply both sides by it. And then we would have the current is equal to that inverse matrix multiplied by the voltage column matrix. Well, your calculator does all of this for you. So all you have to do is come back to this was our set of equations. And you just take this matrix A and slap it up against that matrix E to make this here. So this is a three by four matrix where I just put in the numbers from what I found. And then I use the row reduction echelon form, RREF, function on my calculator. So at this point, I do only have one minute, but I'm just going to show you how we can do this real quickly and easily to get our answer. So 